was around 16, 17 years old when this happened. I'm 28 now. For some context, I was a poor high school student studying in a town located around 300 kilometers from my home. Back then I lived in rural Moldavian Republic and studied in Romania where I had a scholarship to cover most of my expenses. After winter vacation had ended, I was returning from my home by train. Now, the train station was a really desolated place. There weren't any apartment buildings for almost a one kilometer radius or so. The train arrived at 11 p.m. and the buses circulated until around 11 p.m. This was Romania, so no actual reliable schedule. I was alone and there was a significant walking distance from the train station to my high school campus dorm, but taking a taxi was far too expensive for me back then and I didn't want to bother any of my friends or colleagues. So the stupid teenager I was proceeds to think I can simply walk to the nearest bus station and if I'm lucky, I'll get a bus. If not, then I'll just walk to the campus, around an hour's walk. I got out of the train and it was a cold dark night. The area around the train station was completely desolated except for a few Romani shacks, gypsies if you're more familiar with this term, scattered around. I proceed to start walking towards the campus. After a few minutes, I think I hear something behind me and I get a dreadful feeling. I ignore it and start walking faster. A few more seconds pass and I can hear someone calling to me in a raspy voice. Hey, beauty. Why in such a hurry? Wait for me. I am really creeped out but I can't find the courage to look behind me so I start walking even faster. The guy behind me keeps up. I can now hear his footsteps. I get scared and proceed to walk the fastest I can without actually running. I hear him behind me. Now that's not nice. Where do you think you're going? I turn my head and see a dirty shaggy man looking in his 30s. At this point, I am really scared. Beyond trying to keep my calm scared, the area around me is pitch black and silent. There are no houses, no people and even no streets that have any traffic around and I don't have a cell phone. This happened more than 10 years ago in Romania and I was poor. I proceeded to run. I run as fast as I can towards the nearest populated street I can think of. I can hear him running behind me and not only keeping up but catching up on me. I reach the nearest circulated street and he is two steps behind me yelling angrily. Where do you think you're going? Two seconds pass by and I see a small bus passing by. I was nowhere near a bus station but I started moving my hands and gesturing frantically trying to get the bus driver to stop. Happily, he noticed me and stopped and just as I close the door still panicking, I see the guy grabbing at the door trying to open it. But it's too late. The bus starts moving away. I thank the bus driver profusely. He said he noticed the guy running behind me and that I was in a panic and that's why he stopped. I'm not a religious person, but damn, it felt like someone was looking after me and sent the bus in the nick of time to save me. Back in 2007, I started a tech job with an IP, phone, VoIP, DT1, long distance company. The company is no longer around, and honestly, I don't know how they stayed in business as long as they did. It was really a pyramid scam, but thankfully, I was on the IT side of things so I didn't have to sell anything. It was a small typical tech support call center. The customers would call in on Veras and Quest, etc., would call and say DT1 lines were down or outages. I was the only female on my team, having to prove myself and show that I can do anything my male counterparts could. It didn't take long and the customers respected me for being able to handle things. After making my mark, I decided to take the 10 hour night shifts. I worked Wednesday to Saturday from 1pm to 12am, an hour's lunch, and after 6pm I was completely alone in the whole building. The rush to get out of the office by 6pm was insane, and I couldn't blame them, but I decided having three days off was better than two. Like I said, I was by myself for most of the night. I would have to keep an eye on emails and make sure I answered calls. It was a very slow shift. I would get a lot of video gaming, reading, schoolwork, writing during this time done, but sometimes I would just wander around the building, walk all around just to get away from my desk for a time. I would have the VoIP phone system connected to my cell phone so no calls would be missed. This allowed me to get up and go get a soda, go get food and so on. 
One time while I was up away from my desk, I was going down to the lunchroom to grab a soda. The vending machine was on the basement floor. The basement had a wall of windows and one set of security doors. Same for the main entrance, only there was one camera facing that door. Nothing else really to make you feel very safe. I didn't like going to the basement much because the back of the building faced an acre of dark woods. There was a walk path to the woods, but for some reason, they didn't install lights for the walking path. Never really sure why that was, but it didn't help the creepy factor. Sometimes I would see animals run past, but other times, I felt like someone was watching me. I always tried my best to make it fast when getting a soda or snack, but sometimes, it didn't feel fast enough. So, one night, I was making my way down to the basement of the building to get a soda. It was a slow dragging night and I needed a little caffeine for a pick me up. I counted my money as I walked to make sure I had enough to get in and out quickly. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw something dart from the glass door back into the darkness. I stopped dead in my tracks and tried to scan the forest, but like I said, it was just blackness. I felt a bit of unease and everything told me to turn on my heels and go back to my desk. But it was 9pm and I had a fair bit of time left on my shift before I could blow this pop stand. I tried shaking the feelings off and briskly walked over to the soda machine and made my selection. The soda dropped and as I bent down to get it, I heard a loud ping noise. It was as if someone had hit the glass with something. I slowly turned around and was scared to see someone out there. But as I made the full turn, I saw once again nothing but darkness. I thought this was a good time to book it back up to the main floor. I didn't bother with the elevator. I went to the stairs and ran up them. My heart was already racing from having to go down there in the first place. Then the loud bang and now running up two flights of stairs. Once I was back at my desk, I sunk down in my chair and tried to calm down. It was just one noise. I was in a building with locked doors and locked inner offices. I kept saying over and over in my head that it was nothing. I was relieved by that. Out of nowhere, I got that feeling of someone watching me again. I peeked up over my cubicle wall and looked around my office. Nothing seemed out of place until I turned to face the front of the building. Outside the first set of doors, there was a slender, tall, dirty male. He was cupping his hands around his eyes to try and see past the reflecting of the lights inside. I dropped back down in the cubicle before he caught sight of me. He didn't look like anyone I'd ever seen at the office, and it was a little past 9pm. There was no good reason why he was checking out my office. As I sat in my chair, I hear the door shake. I slowly stood up and watched him pull at the handles of the doors. They didn't budge, to my relief. But as I watched him, he turned to face me. His face looked bruised or dirty. I couldn't tell which. Once his eyes locked onto mine, he started to bang harder and smack the glass. I was so scared. It was the middle of the night. I was by myself and out in the middle of this office building complex. I grabbed my headset and dialed 911. While getting the operator on the line, the guy was walking back and forth from one side of the glass doors to the next. 911, what's your emergency? The lady's voice was direct. Yeah, uh, my name is... And uh, I work at... I need someone to come out. There's a guy trying to break into my office building. While speaking with her, the guy disappeared from view. I tried to look in all directions, but I couldn't see him. I knew that he wouldn't just walk off, not with how hard he was banging. And out of nowhere, a good-sized rock came out of nowhere and smashed against the door. I screamed and went under my desk. The operator asked what just happened, and I explained that a rock smashed against the glass door. She asked if the glass was broken enough to let him in. I didn't want to stand up and look, but she told me to look in order to know where he was now. I crawled out from under my desk and just peeked over my wall and saw a huge crack down the first part of the door. I sank down and told her to please have the police hurry. She said that they were on their way. I have heard many of the stories here and people say that the cops couldn't get there fast enough and they aren't kidding. It feels like time is standing still and you can't do anything. Another smash against the door, but along with that, there's a glass breaking sound. Sirens could be heard coming towards my building. It was music to my ears. I told the operator that the police had arrived and thanked her for all of her support. I stood back up and looked over the cubicle wall and the red and blue lights were flashing wildly. But the thing I didn't see 
was the man. The top part of the door was completely smashed and the rock was laying on the inside of the entryway. One officer came to the front door and others were combing the area. I could see their flashlights moving all around the parking lot. The first officer who came into the building to greet me was a very kind man. He was patient with me and let me explain what I saw happen. Soon, my boss arrived and checked on me, then the damage. At some point, my husband was called and told that I would be escorted home by one of the officers. I took the next few days off and started to look for another job that wasn't by myself at night. When I gave my statement, I explained to the officer that the person could be partnered with an ex-co-worker who was fired a few weeks prior for stealing and just not showing up. He knew when people came and went. He knew where we kept the cell phones we were selling, not under lock and key, but under a desk of the provisioner. There were things from smartphones to Blackberries, plus VoIP boxes and phone cards there. I went on to leave this job a month later and started at a credit card machine company. It was an office full of people, still a call center, but I felt safer, especially with the security and cameras all over the building. Like I said before, this company is no longer around. It was bought up by another company, and they basically liquidated all of the funds that were worth something. This all happened at a secluded lake cabin in deep south Texas, owned by my parents about 20-ish years ago. When I say secluded, I mean very secluded. It was maybe 40 minutes to the highway, 40 minutes to the nearest town with population of 800, and over an hour to the nearest city of any size. The last four miles or so were down a washed out but public dirt road. The road did a tight turnaround directly in front of our cabin, as ours was the last one accessible by it. There was one more cabin past us, but accessed by a private driveway only. On one side of the road there was a cliff, the other side was our cabin, then a tract of grass, maybe 80 feet wide to the water edge, pier, etc. Next to the pier was a patch of dense woods, maybe two acres deep and then a swampy area going to the next cabin, the one accessed by the private drive. It was kind of scary, as it all created kind of a funneled area to a dead end. We had been there for weeks at a time and not seen any other human before. Many of the other cabins were seldom visited, if not completely abandoned. This night we had headed into the city to go shopping. We ended up making a night of it. By the time we got back to the cabin, it was 4am. The windows of the cabin had these big wooden shutters that flapped down over the windows from the outside. Knowing that everyone would want to sleep in, I went to pull them to keep the early morning sun out. I got back inside and everyone was ready to go to sleep. The sleeping quarters were all one big room. Altogether, there were six adults and two teens this night. I finished with the shutters, made sure everyone was ready for bed and turned off all the lights, indoor and out. Strangely, less than five minutes later, we see headlights coming from around the bend of the road. It was very obvious since it was otherwise so dark. We all thought it was probably just some fishermen coming to launch a boat as it would sometimes happen. Van got to the turnaround, spun around as if to leave the same way they had come, and then stopped. When they didn't immediately turn around and leave, I got up to look out the only window on that end of the building. My big, tough, mostly just nosy firefighter uncle soon joined me, while my dad made sure the guns were at the ready, just in case. We were fully expecting them to start messing with my uncle's truck, or attempting to take stuff from the bed, but clearly, that was not their intent. There was enough moonlight and light from their parking lights to see an adult man get out of the van with two young children. Both boys, we think, but not certain. The driver backed into and down the private drive for the last house, parked and got out with two long poles. My uncle and I have had several discussions as to whether these were sticks or rifles. He handed one to the other guy. The men were both dressed appropriately for the weather. It was cold and they had long pants and jackets but the kids were in lightweight pajama pants and no shirts. By this time, both kids were audibly crying. The men started leading both children into the woods and down to the swampy area, holding each by an arm. At this point, we were flapping out and trying to decide what exactly to do. Props to my uncle for his quick thinking. He used the panic button to set off his truck alarm. Suddenly, the van started up. Apparently, there was a third person waiting inside and frantically pulled out of the driveway. 
The men and the boys jumped in the van and tore off down the road. We all looked out the windows as best as we could, not very well considering the shutters, to try and get a description of the van, but only managed a vague general description. This being a while ago, my mum was the only one with a cell phone, and we knew it only worked way out of the very end of the pier. So myself, my uncle, and my dad each took a gun and made the long trek out there to dial 911, frantically pointing the guns at any sound, while the rest of our party held down the fort. After fumbling trying to get a connection, we were finally able to get law enforcement on the line, but they never caught them. In the summer of 2015, I was 33 years old, broke and jobless in Mexico City. My entire life had gone steadily down the drain for the past couple of years and my best friend had moved back to Europe. I was tired and bored, so when an online friend I had met in person two years before invited me to spend a month in his farmhouse in Norway, I accepted without hesitation. The deal was simple. In exchange for some work at the farm, I would get some pretty sweet holidays in a country I always, always wanted to visit. I have no problem doing labor work, and in fact, I was looking forward to doing it and getting my body back into real action. Since I moved back to Mexico City from Canada in 2011, I had been feeling rusted and soft. So I packed my suitcase, put on my boots and said goodbye to Mexico City the best way I knew how, by getting pissed drunk. I arrived to Stavanger in Norway but my suitcase decided to go to Thailand instead. So, after an hour of filling in the reports and giving the address of my friend's house, I was able to walk out and meet him again, my friend Harold. He was standing there, confused and annoyed. He told me later that he was about to leave the airport thinking that I decided not to take the flight after all. I guess I was lucky. That night I spent it with Harold and his friends in an oceanfront apartment in a quiet neighborhood in Stavanger getting drunk in Norwegian beer and smoking hash. Disgusting shit if you ask me. I prefer the real thing. But anyways, I felt welcomed and content. The next day Harold drove me all the way to his farmhouse about an hour south of Stavanger in a community called Edgesund. At least, I think that's the name of the place I was in. Norwegian names and addresses are weird if you're not familiar with them. The land Harold owned was huge and beautiful. Not really sure of how it all works, but in this property, there's a lighthouse that attracts a lot of tourists from all over Europe. The house itself was small and located on the top of a hill with a barn next to it. Harold lived alone in the two-story house, but I was told that the basement housed a tenant. As soon as I glanced to the basement window, I got a strange feeling of dread. There was a webcam facing the driveway, and the rest of the window was covered by boxes and papers but I decided not to mention it since Harold didn't seem to care. I just assumed that the guy was an eccentric man, or maybe it was just a normal precaution, considering that we were more or less in the middle of nowhere with the neighboring house separated by big fields. I just took my mind out of it and focused on the joy of being in Norway. After being installed in one of the bedrooms upstairs, I was informed that week that Harold's son's wedding was going to be celebrated, and thus the house would be filled with the bride's family from Bergen, I think. In general, it was great to meet them, but on my second night, when everybody had gone to sleep and Harold and I were still up chatting and drinking the beer, I got to meet the tenant, Olaf. Harold had been having some troubles with his new smartphone, and apparently Olaf was tech savvy, and had indeed been the one purchasing the phone for Harold. So, we went downstairs to Olaf's basement. Now, Harold kept telling me that he didn't like Olaf and was actually upset by the way that Olaf kept the newly remodeled basement. But from what I understood, they had some kind of relationship, more than just landlord and tenant. The basement was dark, all the windows were covered and piles of junk cluttered the entire place. The bedroom was full of computer parts and electronic junk that he had blinking and beeping. Olaf invited us to sit down and we turned on a desk lamp to check Harold's phone, and I got the first real good look of him. He was in his mid-forties, but looked older. Shaved head, really skinny, big nose and deep shadows under his eyes. He had the entire look of a meth addict. I should know since I worked in a recovery house in Surrey, British Columbia and Canada. I had seen the same face back then in people who were dealing with severe addictions. The way he stuttered only confirmed further my observations and I decided to keep an eye on him. My gut told me right then and there that he was trouble. 
Olaf finished with Harold's phone and then directed his attention to me. He asked if I wanted to see some porn, to which I declined entirely. I just wanted to leave that dark, oppressive basement. Harold laughed a drunken laughter and asked Olaf if he had gay porn, to which Olaf said that he didn't care about the sexuality of the videos. He simply liked to see people getting things introduced in them. When he said that, I got chills running down my spine, and I asked myself if he meant it just in a sexual way or if there was a more ominous meaning to it, but we didn't stay to find out. Harold had a busy day the next day, and I was tired and thoroughly creeped out by him. When we were back in the house, I asked Gerald if he trusted his friend, to which Harold answered that Olaf wasn't his friend. He was just an addict renting the basement. The government paid Harold the rent, and a nurse visited him twice a week to bring him his medication, and after dropping that bomb, he said goodnight and went to his bedroom. I tried not to think about Olaf, but between my gut feeling and him popping into the house unannounced when everyone else was preparing for the wedding that weekend, I couldn't really relax. The first time he went inside was to give me a flash drive with movies that he had illegally downloaded from the internet. He made sure to emphasize the illegal part. The second time, he seemed high and wanted to simply let me know that if I needed something, I could ask him for anything, but asked me not to tell Harold about going upstairs. He said that and then walked out very slowly and carefully as if he knew he would fall if he rushed. When the wedding was over and the house was again empty except for Harold and me, the encounters with Olaf became stranger and more often. One time while I was in the kitchen fixing myself some breakfast, I turned around to find Olaf standing in the kitchen door bleeding from his nose, just staring at me. I jumped out of my skin and dropped my breakfast, making a huge mess but he didn't seem to notice. He simply started babbling incoherently while directing his cloudy eyes to the ceiling on top of my head. I was petrified, trying to think of a train of actions that wouldn't trigger a violent response by him, when he simply turned around and quietly walked out of the house. I started locking the door whenever I was alone in that house since that day. When I told Harold about all of this, he got visibly mad and went downstairs to talk or yell at Olaf. Harold told me that he didn't like to leave him in the basement, and he had tried to kick him out several times, but the government had always ruled against evicting Olaf, and Harold's sister was mostly responsible for it. She felt bad for the guy, and was 100% on Olaf's side, just because he had the same name as her father. Go figure. So Harold had to learn to live with him in his basement, but only because Olaf was supposed to be clean and in treatment for his addiction. After that day, Olaf stopped being friendly with me, and became just a cold invasive presence in my life there. There was one day when I was in the barn chatting with a couple of Harold's friends, when Olaf entered the barn to place his laptop and some homemade looking gadget by the window. Despite nobody asking him, he began to explain to us that he was using it to hack into people's networks to get their Wi-Fi passwords. You know, like everyone does, right? He gave me a nasty glare and then stormed out. I turned to Harold's friends and told them that I was completely afraid of him, and I had this feeling that he would attack me one day. Harold's friends told me that that would never happen, but if I ever felt in real danger, I could give them a call and they would pick me up. We exchanged numbers, hugged, and said goodbye for the night. The next few days, things between Harold and me turned sour, mostly because I wasn't feeling safe anymore, and I had expressed my wish to instead go to Germany to visit the man who is now my husband. Apparently, Harold had hoped for us to grow closer, but had failed to let me know. In the end, I was exhausted and didn't want to deal with any of that anymore. I should also mention that Harold has a severe alcoholism I wasn't aware of until that month that I spent with him, seeing him get filthy wasted on a daily basis. To some, that might be attractive, but not to me. So altogether, the situation was bad, and I wanted out. I had done my job, I had done nothing wrong, and I wanted to be able to relax away from both of them. The night I decided to organize my flight to Germany from Norway, Harold went out to get drunk and didn't come back until the morning the next day. I had tried to stay up to wait for him to talk, but I must have fallen asleep at some point. I woke up to the sound of the front door being closed, and I caught a glance of him walking towards the barn with the dog and a six-pack of beers through the living room window. I then tried to send him a message through Facebook, but I discovered that the internet was down. That's weird, I thought. In the whole time I had been there, the internet never failed, not even once. 
I went to the router and restarted it a couple of times, to no avail. I decided to let it be. Maybe Harold had cut the internet as a way of drunk childish punishment, so I would just get on with my morning routine and have breakfast before going to knock on the barn door. That would give him some time to blow off some steam, I thought. I went downstairs to the bathroom, got comfortably naked and jumped into the shower, ready to refresh myself and sing a couple of songs to lift up my spirits, in preparation for the grim talk that awaited me with Harold. Halfway through the first song, I heard a loud bang coming from the front door, followed by someone screaming my name. I thought Harold must have been pissed drunk and angry. I sighed while turning off the shower, thinking that I was going to have a long argument, when the bathroom door slammed open, and I saw, to my horror, Olaf coming at me with a completely deranged expression on his face, wielding a big cutter knife, the kind employees use in a warehouse to open boxes. For a few seconds, I couldn't think or focus on anything other than the knife in his hand and the fact that I was naked, wet and cornered in a small bathroom in the middle of nowhere in Norway. I was paralyzed. My biggest fear was actually happening. I couldn't scream or move. Just stare at the knife. He kept pulling and pushing, making that now horrifying noise that those blades do when operated. I was about to pass out when Olaf's screams brought me back to the gravity of the situation. He was yelling, accusing me of playing Harold's feelings. He was calling me a liar, a filthy Mexican, and throwing some threats about cutting me open and fucking me up if I tried to take anything from Harold. That, I think, is what got my gears moving once again. He called me a thief. I can be called whatever, but I am not a thief, and I'm not a liar. So standing there, getting myself angry as the psycho in front of me threatened my life, my training from the recovery house in Canada kicked in. I remembered the rules when dealing with altered addicts. Make eye contact, keep your hands down so you don't startle them, speak in a calm but dominant voice, and always, always refer to them by their name. And that's exactly what I did, despite the fear and the uncertainty of being stabbed to death. I stared at him in his cloudy, crazy wide open eyes and said, Olaf, you are a thief. You are the one who keeps stealing Harold's silverware, Olaf. You are the one who keeps breaking into his house, Olaf. Harold is not your friend, Olaf. Harold doesn't even want you living here. It was a long shot, but it worked. My words made him confused, and I was able to take one single small step forward, making him take one small step back. He then charged at me again with his rant and wielding his knife to my chest and neck. I could feel the cold sweat dripping on my back and a burning void forming in my stomach every time he launched the knife forward, but I didn't flinch. I stood my ground and kept repeating the same words to him, every time gaining another step, pushing him little by little out of the bathroom. He might have noticed what I was doing, but by then, it was too late. When he took the last step out of the bathroom door frame, I moved as fast as my terrorized body allowed me to and slammed the door on his stupid crooked nose. I looked at it immediately and pushed against it with all of my body, while a storm of curses, punches and kicks rained on that little farmhouse door. I remember praying to a god that I don't really believe in to hold the door in place, to keep that psycho addict outside. There was nothing I could use in that bathroom to defend myself, nothing against an infuriated high psychopath wielding a knife and possibly a broken nose anyway. After what seemed to be an eternity, I heard, felt, a last super strong kick to the door, and then, to my relief, he stormed out of the house with a loud bang of the front door, announcing his exit. However, I stayed put for another 20 minutes, not able to breathe or think anything else than keeping that door closed. I wanted to puke, but I couldn't move. Eventually, my senses came back and I knew that I had to act quickly. I opened the door of the bathroom, flew upstairs, got dressed and then exited the house through the window to the garden. I knew he could hear me moving on the first floor, and he had his stupid camera spying the driveway. I jumped to the garden, jumped the fence, and ran around the house to the barn. I kicked and banged and screamed for Harold to let me in, but it was useless. The drunk fuck was living his drama and I needed help. So I ran all the way to the next house where his sister lived, rang the bell, and when she opened, I explained to her as best as I could what had just happened. She didn't speak a word of English, so it was a comical exchange for about 10 minutes until her expressions shifted from confusion to absolute terror, mirroring my own. She walked me up to the barn, opened the door, commanded Harold to guard me, and went straight to the basement to confront Olaf. 
I was shocked and shaking, still trying to explain to Harold what had just happened. His drunken state was gone by the time I had finished explaining. He too went to the basement and I could just hear the screams. They took him out. The sister and her husband got all left in her car and took him away. Harold stayed with me all day. I drank so much beer, but I just couldn't get drunk. I wanted to get drunk. I wanted to forget, but I just couldn't. I was told that Olaf admitted to having the knife and that his intentions were to make me fight him. So, in reality, he wanted an excuse to stab my naked butt. After all, he liked to see people having things introduced to them, right? That night I slept in the house while Harold kept guard of the house. I had some tools with me to defend me and of course, I slept fully dressed. It was a horrible night. The next morning we went to the police to file a report but even the cops seemed baffled and couldn't believe that something like that could ever happen in their small, peaceful, picture-perfect community. But they believed me, and the cop who took my statement asked me if there was somewhere I could go while they sorted out the mess with Olaf. I told them that in fact that I was planning to visit Germany the very next day. That last day, I barely spoke with Harold. I didn't blame him, but he told me that in his drunken state, he had told Olaf that I was leaving, and he was sad about it. Since Olaf had been doing drugs all night, he understood that he had to defend Harold. So he, Olaf, cut off the internet, waited for me to go in the shower, and went upstairs to do his job. I left Norway without a single word, without looking back. They told me I could testify via Skype whenever the trial started, so they took my information and promised me justice would be served. It's been more than a year now, and I've never heard back from the police. When I asked Harold about it, he told me that the police dropped the case for a lack of evidence. And Olaf is back in Harold's basement, doing whatever it is that he does. I guess life goes on. I was angry for a while, but even anger goes away after a while if there's nothing to burn. I tried to focus on the good things of life, and life itself. Every day now is a gift, or a chance, but the shadow of that fear never really left me. I keep looking over my shoulder, keep studying people just in case I have to defend myself. I still have a sense of dread whenever I take a shower, especially at the gym where I'm more vulnerable. I can't help thinking that anyone else would have ended a bloated corpse in a pool of blood in that shower unnoticed for hours and hours until someone had to use that bathroom. If I had done something different, if all I've hadn't been so high to be intimidated by my words, that bloated corpse would have been me. I still don't know how to get rid of that thought, but I try. All I know is that Olaf is free, and I really, really don't want to meet him again. This happened just last night, and honestly, I'm still a little shaken up over it. I'll try to retell the tale exactly as it happened my fear is sure to have fudged my memory a bit. I work evenings as a dispatcher in a medium-sized Midwestern city. I was driving home at 2am when I stopped for gas. In retrospect, it was stupid to have stopped at all. The gas station was poorly lit and completely empty of any other customers, but I knew the shady areas of town and this was not usually one of them. As I was pumping gas, I noticed a middle-aged black woman sitting on the curb across the parking lot. It was a cold night and it just started raining. The woman was not wearing weather-appropriate clothing, so she was drenched. When the woman saw I was watching her, she called out to me from across the parking lot. My second of many stupid decisions that night was choosing to engage with her. I was worried for her, so I approached her to see what sort of help I could offer. Hi, beautiful. Uh, I'm just trying to get home, but no one will help me, she said. I'm trying to get to City A. But the cab ride is $60 and I only have $40. Can you help me? I don't usually give money to panhandlers, but this woman seemed genuine. The weather was terrible and my job centers around helping people, so I agreed. I told her I didn't have any cash, but if she would come inside with me, I'd take some money out of the ATM and give her a few dollars. But the ATM wasn't working. I apologized and told her that there was nothing else I could do for her. She followed me back outside, idly chatting with me as I opened my driver's door to get in. And then she got in my car. 
I was too shocked to really say anything. I sat staring at her as she buckled herself into the passenger seat. As soon as she got into my car, her demeanor changed entirely. Just take me to my aunt's house, she said. She can give me some money. Of course, alarm bells are going off in my head. Although my first instinct is to tell her to get the fuck out of my car, my gut tells me that that would be dangerous. She'd already proven to be unpredictable. She seemed to be high, and I didn't know if she had any weapons on her. Forcing her out of the vehicle, I thought, had the potential to elicit a violent reaction. Where are you asking me to take you? I finally said. Just start driving and I'll tell you where to turn. No, if you want me to consider driving you somewhere, I need you to tell me where I'm going. I say, with no real intention of driving her anywhere. Don't worry, honey. I'm not one of the bad blacks. I'm not going to rob you or nothing. Look, just drive. No, I repeated. What is your aunt's address? Okay, it's on Street A. What's the house number? As I was asking her questions, she got really agitated. We still had not left the gas station parking lot. I considered getting out of the car and going into the gas station for help, but A, she seemed to know and was friendly with one of the attendants that was inside when I tried to get money, and B, I wasn't about to leave her alone in my car. Finally, she snapped at me and said, Why are you asking me so many questions? I thought we were friends. You don't trust me? Is it because I'm black? I work at a police department, I said. It's my job to ask these sort of questions. She flipped the fuck out. She started yelling at me about being a snitch, about trying to get her into trouble, just in general, losing her damn mind. At this point, I'm more scared than ever. I just wanted her gone, but my instinct still told me that asking her to get out of my car wouldn't work, so I decided to take a risk. I'm not a police officer, I just work at the police department. Look, why don't I take you to the Walmart and we can see if there's any ATMs that work there. My idea was to get her out of the car as peacefully as possible, then lose her in the store. She liked my idea and immediately calmed down. I knew that driving off with this woman in my car was incredibly, incredibly risky, but it seemed like my best option at the time. As we were driving, she keeps talking to me. Her thoughts were erratic, bouncing all over the place. It sometimes seemed difficult for her to follow through with one thought, but this is roughly how our conversation went. I'm glad we're friends now. I have about five or six people trying to get me. I'm going to come to your work tomorrow so that we can arrest them together. Okay, we can talk about that tomorrow. Tonight you said you're trying to get home, right? Yes, honey. I'm trying to get to City B. City B? I thought you said that you needed to go to City A. Y yeah, yeah, City A. That's what I meant. That's why the cab ride is $40. It's pretty far away. The cab ride is $40? You said you have $40. I do, baby. I have 40 but the cab ride is 60 And there was silence. Are you sure you can't take me to my aunt's house? She lives close by on Street B. I thought you said she lived on Street A. No, baby. I meant Street B. But it don't matter because she won't give me money anyway. You sure you can't just take me to City A? It was terrifyingly obvious that this woman was utterly full of shit because the details of her story were constantly changing. When we pulled into the Walmart parking lot, she finally got out of my car, only after I got out first and followed me into the store. I told her before we went to find an ATM that I needed to use the restroom. My plan was to call the police from inside a stall, but she followed me into the bathroom and that's when things got really weird. She grabbed the crook of my arm and whispered into my ear, if you don't got no money to give me, that's okay. But let me ask you something, sweetie. Do you like getting your pussy ate? I told her no as forcefully as I could manage, bolted into a stall, and locked the door as fast as I could possibly manage. As soon as I had a barrier between us, I said, You know, I have some friends at the police department that can probably help you better than I can. I'm just going to call them and we can figure this out together. Again, at the mention of cops, she started screaming at me. I just kept reiterating that the police would help her. She snapped at me that she was going to leave and stormed out of the bathroom, but it wasn't over. I waited to make sure that she was really gone. Sure enough, not 60 seconds after she left, she came back into the bathroom and started banging on the stall door, and she said something that scared me more than anything else. 
Hey, come back to your car with me. I left my beer in your car. I blatantly tell her that no. I saw her get into my car and she had absolutely nothing with her other than the clothes on her back. After that, she left the bathroom again and didn't come back. I waited a good five minutes before exiting the bathroom. I immediately found a manager who called the police for me. Thankfully, I was in a different police jurisdiction from the one I work in because I was mortified at how entirely stupid I had been the whole night and would have died of embarrassment if any of my co-workers had responded. The officer that responded took my statement and advised me to be more careful in the future. He said that sometimes panhandlers turn violent and that just recently there had been a report of a woman who matched my description assaulting a good Samaritan that stopped to try and help her. I definitely learned a lesson on stranger danger and I'm lucky to have come out unscathed. I'm glad that my stupidity didn't kill me. My mother said that she fell in love with the house from the moment she first laid eyes on it, but as soon as I set foot in it, I knew something was off. It's not that I'm particularly perceptive or anything like that, but from the start, the place had an ominous feeling. On paper, it was great. Only a few decades old, custom built, two acres of land, five bedrooms, and a safe neighborhood. There was no reason for it to be haunted, at least none that I ever found, and to this day, I'm really not sure why the house was how it was, but whatever it was, it was mean. That was my first impression. The house didn't like new people, and in the whole 10 years that we lived there, it never started liking new people. Or maybe it's more accurate to say they never started liking new people. I really can't say. What I can tell you is that this was made clear to me on the very first night in the house. I was having trouble sleeping for all the reasons you'd expect, I was around nine, we just moved, it was a new place and more than anything, everything in the house just felt off. My parents assured me that I'd settle into the new place in no time, that it was my imagination and that I just wasn't used to the new house's quirks yet and I wanted to believe them, I really did. But then, I heard the tapping. I had just about dozed off when the sound of tapping at my door startled me awake. My door opened out into the hall and I left it open for whatever reason, but because the head of the bed rested on the same wall as my door, I couldn't see it or whatever might have been making the noise. I could hear it though. It was only a few feet away, and after a pause, just long enough to make me think that I'd imagined things, it started up again. It sounded like someone tapping insistently with one finger, and it was low. Not low as in pitch, but low as in the noise itself was coming from the lower part of the door. It would go for a little bit, stop for a long pause, and then kick back up again right when I thought it might be over. Don't ask me how long this kept up because I did what any sensible kid would do. I hid under the covers, told myself it was the door hinges, even though I knew that it wasn't true, and eventually, I passed out. This didn't happen often, and eventually, I did learn to ignore it. When I mentioned it to my parents, they floated the hinge idea too, or that maybe it was the cat pouring at the door or something. That didn't make any sense either, but I was fine with pretending to believe it. Until, one night, my brothers started screaming and sobbing. They were younger than me and shared a room next to mine, and when my parents rushed in to ask them what was wrong, all they would say was that they didn't like the crawling girl because she wouldn't stay in the closet anymore. Our parents called it a nightmare, but we started calling it the crawler. I never got a good look at the crawler though I would often see movement out of the corner of my eye. At the time, I thought it was just a trick of the light or something. It never occurred to me until we moved out of the place that, in fact, most people don't see weird shadows the size of a large dog darting past doors or skirting around corners. The crawler loved my brothers though, and she loved my brother Eddie most of all. Years later, and thankfully in a new house, I finally asked him if he remembered the crawler calling it an imaginary friend we used to have. And he went pale, and after some harassing, told me this story. One night, my brother was home alone watching TV. Our dad was working late, and my other brother and I were at a play rehearsal, but he was in high school and plenty old enough to chill out alone for a few hours. Now, everyone in my family is pretty tall, but my brother was a football player at the time and wanted to join the army, 
so he was serious about working out and was built like a teenage tank. He also had the bravado to match. When the power supply cut out, he quickly determined that it wasn't a streetwide outage, went down into the unfinished basement to check the circuit breaker. We never used the basement for anything other than storage, so it was at once both weirdly sprawling and cramped at the same time. There was old furniture, boxes, luggage, the usual stuff, and it extended the whole length of the large house. As he was checking the fuse box trying to remember what our dad had taught him, he heard something moving in the far end of the room. Assuming one of the cats had wandered in while he wasn't looking, he absently called for it and ignored it. But then, the movements became louder, and he thought instead that it was the family dog until he remembered the dog was outside in the yard still. Being the macho guy he was, he grabbed a golf club and shone his phone light in the direction of whatever it was, now assuming that it was a raccoon or something skittering between the stacks of boxes. And that's when he saw it. He described her as an incredibly pale woman crawling towards him, but she wasn't on her hands and knees. He said she was moving on her feet, but the angle of her legs didn't make a whole lot of sense. He couldn't tell if she was naked or wearing a pale gown, and her hair was a mousy brown color and stringy but wild. He said she moved towards him so fast and with this blank yet manic look on her face, like she was slack-jawed but had a purpose. Being the genius that he is, he threw his phone at her rather than the golf club and got the hell out of there, bolting upstairs and out of the front door where he sat at the end of the driveway and waited for someone to come home. Now, I remember this incident. I remember us pulling up and my mother seriously thinking someone had died from the look on Eddie's face, and he really was beside himself freaking out. At this point, the lights were all back on again, and when he explained what happened, my mum asked him, I didn't call the cops if he thought someone was in the house. He said that this was because he didn't want to go back in there to get his phone. Why hadn't he gone to the neighbors to use their phone? Do you remember the part where I sarcastically called him a genius earlier? I love him, but my brother's got zero common sense. With our big German shepherd and a phone at the ready to call the cops, we searched the entire house and found no one. My mum retrieved my brother's busted phone and we didn't talk about it afterward. I think we're all thinking of the same explanation, but none of us wanted to be the one to say it. Back to that night years later when I asked him about it, I teased him for his description and told him that he'd seen the ring of the grudge one too many times, but he just looked at me in the eyes and said, she wasn't like that. When I asked him to explain, he refused to say any more about it, and to this day, he won't talk about it. It's amazing what your mind will rationalize when you live with weirdness. My parents are both skeptics with STEM degrees, so they refused to admit that the house was haunted. My brothers and I didn't like to talk about it because, somehow, we felt like talking about it ran the risk of stirring things up, and the activity wasn't constant enough to disrupt daily life. Okay, so we couldn't keep it made longer than a few weeks before they quit, so our friends refused to sleep over because the place was too creepy so things would go missing and appear in bizarre places, so doors would slam hard enough to shake them when no one was anywhere near them. This was all just whatever. That said, I'm not sure if it was this total denial that explains one point of confusion everyone experienced, or if it was something else. Everyone, even my dad who seriously did not believe in ghosts, experienced this weirdness at least a few times. I'll do my best to explain it. Maybe some of the beehive have had similar experiences or have an explanation. The best way I can describe it is mistaken identity. It usually went like this. You'd be sitting in one room, usually alone, and from the other end of the house you'd hear someone having a muffled conversation. My mother said that it sounded like the crowd murmur at a formal party. I thought it sort of sounded like hearing a TV through a wall. In the moment though, your brain would attribute it to some other family member even if you knew they weren't home. It wasn't just momentary forgetfulness either, and I can say this because it wasn't always just muffled conversation. It also didn't strictly sound like whatever person you thought it was. Maybe you'd hear someone laugh or call out, and you'd get this close to answering back before realizing what you were doing. Much later, I asked my brothers if they'd ever heard the things calling their names. They told me no, but that they sometimes hear them calling for my name. And so I concluded, if the crawler liked Eddie, these voices liked me. 
I don't know what it was, but there were nights when a voice right near my ear would wake me up from a deep slumber. I tried to write it off as dreaming or some brain fluke. That is, until I finally got it to stop. One night I woke up because I heard someone rummaging around in my room. This wasn't that unusual. I'd often wake up in the morning to find things on my desk, toppled or shifted around. But this was the first time that I'd awaken up because of it though. I opened my eyes and in the darkness I could vaguely see a figure moving around. I didn't have any glasses on, so to me it was more like a person's shape than a person. But for whatever reason, my brain decided that it was Austin, my other brother. I asked him what he was doing in my room and told him to knock it off and let me sleep using some choice pissed off older sister phrases. The figure looked over its shoulder at me and said, Oh, sorry, I'll leave you alone now. It was definitely a young man's voice. It definitely wasn't in my head. I was definitely awake and propped up on an elbow. The figure then walked into my bathroom and only once it was gone did I realize that I hadn't seen a face on it. My eyesight's a little crummy, but not that bad especially not when it passed so close by me. I bolted out of bed and turned on all the lights, but there was no one to be found. There's more to this though, because even with everything I said, it's still easy to assume that I was dreaming, right? Right after I turned on my lights, my dad marched into my room because he'd also heard someone moving stuff around in there and had heard me talking to someone. He had also assumed that it was Austin for no particular reason, but both of my brothers were were in their beds asleep, and after that, the rummaging and nightly calls stopped. Interestingly though, the bathroom where the figure went had once been a Jack and Jill shared bathroom between the two rooms before we remodeled part of the house. Before the remodeling, my brothers would sometimes complain that our dad kept wandering through on patrol in the middle of the night to check on them, coming out of the shared bathroom and leaving through their bedroom door. It never scared them, but they just thought that it was weird. My dad never did patrols at night though. This wasn't the last time the whole no-face concept would pop up around the house. The most common complaint of relatives or friends staying the night was that they'd see a figure standing in their doorway. It never scared them and most wrote it off as a trick of the light, but all of them described him as a shadow with no face. Sometimes the sound of someone whistling could be heard as well, almost always at night. This was rare and there wasn't any particular song. Mostly it had that breathy sound like someone who couldn't really whistle well, absently amusing themselves. My dad was convinced that this had something to do with the air vents. He had a crusade against it, seriously. But no matter how many times he replaced the covers and filters, the whistling came back. It still kills me to this day that he never came up with a good explanation for it. I was given an explanation, but it wasn't great. One evening I was watching my youngest cousin play in the living room. My parents were still in the kitchen catching up with my aunt, and my brothers were off at a friend's house, but I didn't mind supervising while playing on my Game Boy Advance. My cousin was around three years old at the time, and I noticed he kept looking up at the doorway leading to the hall. It wasn't just random staring either. Sometimes he'd turn his head quick like someone was getting his attention, so I finally asked what it was. This is roughly his answer and our following conversation. What are you looking at, Squirt? He still watches you sleep. Okay, creepy. But little kids say creepy things all the time. Little kids are practically made to be creepy. Oh, does he? Yeah, he said he's going to miss you when you're gone. He won't tell me what's wrong with his face. Ah, uh, why? What's wrong with his face? At this point, my cousin mushed his hands against his face a few times all over. I have no idea what that meant, but he added, That's why he whistles sometimes. That's about the time that I called for my mum. There are more stories than I could share. So many, but these last few in particular are always the hardest to tell. I typed this up in a Starbucks in the middle of the day. That's how much I don't like thinking about them alone or in the dark. There was one more thing in the house, and I'm almost positive that it wasn't Whistler or the Crawler. I don't know what it was. I really don't want to. Even on a good, boring day, the house could be creepy, but like I said, we got used to the constant creep factor and learned to ignore it. My brothers and I even took a weird pride in it at times, 
kind of like keeping an ugly family pet. And there were the times when the house was gearing up. It could be day or night. It could be while the house was full of people or empty. There wasn't a rhyme or a reason to it, as far as I could tell. But it especially hated visitors. And more specifically, it hated us for having them over. When the house started gearing up, everything would go quiet. Sound felt muffled, and even our voice wouldn't carry quite as far. Shadows felt thicker somehow, like they were dense or like the light wasn't cutting through them quite as well. Everything went still. If the pets were around, even they would freeze up like they suddenly sensed the air pressure change or knew a predator was lurking around. This probably sounds very Hollywood, but if it helps, I don't think a movie could adequately capture the sudden intense shift in atmosphere. When the house geared up, you knew that you were in for a rough time. The first time I saw it, I was 12 and I couldn't sleep. We had family visiting. My bedroom had been volunteered for my grandparents, so I was sleeping on a sofa in the room that my parents used for a home office at the time. At some point just after I turned off the lights for sleep, the atmosphere had changed and a sense of terrible, intense dread blanketed over me. Somehow I just knew that something was watching me. Despite all the weirdness of the house, I was really paranoid like that the feeling was impossible to shake. Finally, I decided I'd get up and try to sneak into my parents' room and sleep on their floor. This meant opening my eyes and looking at a large antique mirror that hung on the wall. And that's when I saw it. It was standing there like the mirror was a window, blocking the reflection of the rest of the room. Now that I'm older, I know how to describe it accurately. But at the time, I had no idea what decaying corpses looked like. I didn't know that sometimes burned bodies weren't just ash, that skin could burst at the seams like an overboiled sausage and yellow fatty tissue might be exposed. Thanks a lot, internet. Since the image is seared into my brain though, I might as well give a detailed description. He was an adult male, maybe late 30s though, it was hard to say exactly. His nose was thin and his eyes were set close together. He wore dingy work overalls, they were in the same sad state as the rest of him. He had burns on the parts of his body I could see, and the skin of his right arm was too tight and splitting like it had been cooked. The rest of him wasn't in much better shape, and his skin was mottled with what I thought at the time were bruises. Mostly, he looked bloated, and his lips were peeled back to reveal dark gums and poor teeth. I'm not sure if it was his grin, his injuries, or just the state of him, but I know... He was looking right at me. I was sitting up, but I couldn't move or breathe. It felt like we stared at each other for forever. Though, it was probably only a minute or so before I started screaming like I was being murdered and ran for it. I refused to set foot in the office again, but that didn't really help matters. He wasn't confined to that mirror, and I wasn't the only one who saw him. He liked women, it seemed. At one point, my parents were having a small holiday party, when suddenly, there was a big commotion from one of the back rooms. A woman had gone wandering looking for the bathroom, and she was beside herself insisting that she'd seen a thing hiding behind a bookshelf. We asked if it was a bug, a mouse, but she said no, that it was a man peering around from behind the shelf at her. But that was impossible. The shelf was backed up against the wall. How could anything fit back there, let alone a person? She had no idea, but she said that he looked dead. The party wrapped up shortly after the woman was driven home. The guests wrote it off as her having too much wine and being a theatrical sort of person in general. But years later, any time she ran into my mum, she'd bring up the ghost. It's hard to say for sure, but it felt as though that broke some kind of long-standing truce between us and the house. From that point on, it actively ramped up. A large picture in my room threw itself off of a wall. When I say through, I mean it just lifted up, somehow managed to not knock the toys lined up on a bookshelf just below it, and launched a good 10 feet across the other side of the room. All I heard was the crash of it right after I'd just walked out of the room. The place felt more oppressive. Everyone was on edge and depressed, and I'm not sure if we were sleeping well. At night you could hear footsteps walking up and down the wooden floor of the long hallway. A putrid, rotting smell would appear and linger in random spots. There was never any explanation for it. Appliances would turn on and off by themselves, and lights would flicker. 
and no matter how many times the electrician was out, he could never figure out what was wrong with the wiring. Ultimately, this was the reason my parents gave for us moving. They were worried about a fire hazard. I have a different theory. My mum told me this story many years and a few glasses of wine later. One night, about three months before we moved out completely, my parents had had an argument. My dad decided to stay up and watch TV in the den while my mother went to bed. My dad ended up falling asleep on the sofa. A few hours later, my mum woke up because she felt someone get into the bed with her and assumed it was dad. She opened her eyes and the dead man's face was so close to hers, she thought that their noses were practically touching. She felt freezing cold and she could smell the putrid stench that had been wandering around the house. She said it felt like she was being smothered or burned and she couldn't breathe. She tried moving but she felt pinned. So all she could do was pray and clutch at the sheets while he stared at her and her throat closed. The thing finally let up and vanished just as quickly as it had shown up. No fading, no warning, just gone. Normally, anyone would call this sleep paralysis, but I saw my mum's face when I was home from college for the weekend two days after. I asked if she'd been attacked by a feral cat. She had scratches and welts, blood vessels that burst in her eyes. She had bruises along one side of her neck. There wasn't much of a pattern to them, but they looked deliberate enough that a cashier at the grocery store very quietly asked her if she needed help. At the time, she made up some story about falling while hiking, and even then, I knew it made no sense. She said that she and Dad started sleeping in my room because she liked my mattress better. My family moved shortly after that. Once we were out of the house, we began to realize just how stressful and strange living there had been. An older couple bought the place, and last I heard, they totally gutted and redone it to the point that it might as well be a totally different home. I don't know if they ever experienced anything in there, but I hope not. The activity definitely didn't follow us, but if there's anything from that house that could have, I fear it's the dead man, and sometimes I still get nervous when... I look in the mirror at night.